Hello and welcome. What we're going to be looking at in this video is how to critically analyze and certainly some starting points for you to analyze the play wit. Now even though it is a simple play, it can be one that is a little bit complex to study given the fact that there are a number of layers and a number of different techniques it uses. The fact that it is also a postmodernist play, as in one which deals with ideas outside of, I guess, normal traditional realms of theatre, it certainly adds to, I guess, a, a different range and different array of techniques that you can use to talk about it. And certainly there are a number of different things you can talk about which aren't limited necessarily to the language of the play itself, but also through the way that it's delivered or the way that the playwright intends for it to be delivered. Now obviously you won't be referring to the performance version of the play, you'll be mainly referring to the, uh, the text version, but the way that it's written is really designed for, um, as all plays are I guess, designed for a, a, a kind of performance and certainly a way that the play should be performed. So it's one that to, to take particular note of. The most important step as an English student as well is to work out which layers of these are important. And certainly if you've had a look at uh, different methods of interpreting uh, this play, there are a number of different layers in which you can interpret it on. And certainly there are a number of different things you can talk about and choose to focus on. So what we're going to look at in this video is look at de-layering the play as a bit of a starting point and sort of go through uh, some of the key techniques and how they are built up and, and layering I guess lay the whole play. Okay, let's start off with some key moments from the play to start looking at in terms of where to find some evidence for your responses. Okay, where Dr. Kalekian announces Vivian's treatment options and certainly goes through that sort of depth. Um, flashbacks to college teaching and childhood. In fact, any of her flashbacks throughout the play are very good sources of ideas. Uh, Susie and, and Vivian sharing a popsicle together the point where she signs the do not resuscitate order. Uh, Ian Ashford reading a children's story is also a particular, um, or reading her a children's story, should I say, is a particular point at one, and finally her death as well. So there are a number of, of key scenes, and really it's not about choosing all of these, it's about choosing which ones you think you can use to, to uh, I guess, develop your response, and certainly one that gives you the most evidence. But this is a very good starting point for you. All right. Let's have a look at some of the key techniques. First of all, we've got the monologues. And certainly the ones which uh, basically reflect a number of different uh, methods and manners of addressing an audience. And that it is a method which is used to build her character and certainly one that represents her change. And certainly the way we are able to see that is through her, her monologues and through her own delivery. And through, I guess, that connection between herself and the audience that empathetic connection between the character and the audience who are watching. So through that creation of that empathetic connection, the one that we f makes us feel for her, we get more of a sensation of what she's going through than if we're just simply watching it from an outsider looking in. And certainly uh, in terms of cancer, it's one of those ones that is very difficult to explain and, and certainly difficult to, I guess, tell someone about sorts of pain and experiences that someone who uh, unfortunately has has, um, has the disease is able is able to um, to I guess um, strive for each day and certainly it shows immense bravery to get through it and certainly that sort of empathetic connection is important for delivering that is also used as a storytelling device and it helps to link experiences and certainly her experiences we, we're linked to this experience of um, her, we're linking the experience of what she says and, and certainly what others say to her and the way that it can be interpreted and certainly uses a number of different points of irony and, and, and uh, makes a number of, of sort of sarcastic, sardonic references which sort of um, really re reinforce this, um, this experience and certainly... Um, uh, as the way that, I guess, language is important, but also through the way that her experiences are important. Um, the characterization also allows Bering's aloof character to come through, and it, and it certainly allows it to come through with a greater sense of softness and humor, which are now allows us to, I guess, be endeared to her. So, in other words, if we were just to look at her character 
I guess, isolated from her own thoughts and feelings, we probably wouldn't have got the same connection with her if, as, unless we actually really start to, I guess, get a look inside her mind. And certainly that look inside her mind allows us to really feel for her a lot more. And certainly if we see someone who's aloof and, and stubborn and arrogant in real life, we, we tend not to like them. So to have an insight into her character allows a little bit more of that. Okay, so let's look at the style of theatre being used in this play. Now, first of all, one of the main techniques it uses is it breaks the fourth wall. In other words, it delivers monologues, like we're just talking about, um, which directly address the audience. And in doing so, and certainly it, it's one of those techniques which is not only indicative of postmodernism, but indicative of one which uh, attempts to establish an emotional connection, particularly between the protagonist and the audience. And certainly because of the nature of, of the protagonist, in this case, someone who is quite deeply unlikable from the outside looking in, we sort of get more of, a, I guess, a, a, a softer and certainly a, a lot more of a human approach to her through this delivery than if we would otherwise. There's a reappropriation of Dunn's poetry, um, crucially understanding the balance between life and death. Not only that, though, it is something which basically, as a, as a postmodern device, as basically reappropriation, allows not only a... a a link between life and death as as much as it is in Dunn's play, but also is more of a contrast between a, a classic, a much older style of text to a modern one. Certainly um, the attitudes and certainly the, the values on display are, are quite uh, different and, and quite markedly different. Um, there's no intermission in this play, which means that it is quite unrelenting in its approach and certainly one that continues to go on. Now, that doesn't necessarily make it uh, postmodernistic. However, one of the things about the way that it is structured is it's one where it sort of attempts to drag you by the shirt and, and continue to move you, move you through it. It doesn't give you a chance to sort of break and, um, and certainly in terms of the theatre audience, doesn't leave an intermission for them to to go out, have a walk around, have a giggle, as most people do in their intermissions, and sort of then come back and, and sort of lose some of that connection. It just continues to go on and drive forward. It uses metafeeder as well, which is a technique uh, that is essentially talking about being in a play within a play. Now, what that means is that it is essentially, it gives the, ch the narrative a bit of a chance to almost step back from itself a little bit, but also um, at, in that particular scene where she talks about, I wonder what I would write if I was writing a play based on this. It sort of, again, re reinforces how language is able to make a statement and certainly able to make such a statement which um, connects uh, not only her experience, but also how literature does that job, how literature is able to convey such emotions and such feelings and certainly it's the fact that she doesn't have the answer to that a, a scholar of language doesn't have the answer to that shows that it's very very difficult despite how good you are to convey those sorts of sensations and feelings into words now these nods to postmodern theater are basically not only a way of expressing but they're also a way of giving value to modern storytelling now in in terms of doing that it allows us to tell a story in such a way where we're not a captive audience. We need to be roped in. We need to be hooked in. And certainly that's one of the values of modern storytelling. The other value, which is particularly important out of this, is that it connects particularly on an emotional level and essentially in one that deals with such a modern hot issue like um, like cancer and particularly ovarian cancer, which is such a, a, a large killer and certainly it's one that's very, very hard to treat. It sort of it really does re-emphasise not only the fact that there's a modern um, play about a I guess a modern content not sorry modern idea, it it really does so in such a way which is representative of I guess not only um, the ideas involved and certainly not in terms of the um, the pain and suffering of the condition, but does so in a way which is able to express them more fully. So essentially it it allows the story to be told in a proper sort of way, and it, it really does justice um, the stories that um, or, or that Edson was using to inspire this, her writing the play, and certainly 
allowed her to uh, express her own feelings and certainly her own, um, I guess, attitudes towards the um, towards not only the condition of cancer but also to make a statement about it as well. All right, let's look at flashbacks. Now, flashbacks, as I said, are a key technique used in this play, and certainly they provide a contrast between Vivian at her strongest, and those are what the flashbacks are to, Vivian at her strongest state and at her weakest state, although you could possibly reverse those roles and say that in terms of, I guess, emotional agility, that she's strongest when she's sick and, and probably weakest when she's intellectual. So it does provide a nice little contrast there. It is important for the audience to see these contrasts as they represent that, that shift between researcher and patient. And certainly, those uh, changes in attitude would not come across as strongly if it, was, if it weren't for those flashbacks. And certainly, we see um, to see her in some position of strength not only uh, humanizes the condition a lot more in that we see how far she's fallen, but we also see her in terms of the, of the fact that she was a bright woman she had everything and uh, that uh, basically an indiscriminate disease something which uh, affects a lot of people almost at random at some it, it, it appears at some times um, it basically it reflects a whole heap of different aspects of what it means to have cancer and certainly what it means what the or basically what it means to um, be someone who is has their life turned around by such a thing, and certainly those contrasts reflect that. They also reflect the contrast between death through language and death through the process of dying, and certainly we get that with a little bit of irony thrown in there. Not only in the in the ironic sense that uh, someone who spends their entire life talking about death knows nothing of it, but also in the sense that uh, they really don't um, match in any kind of way that these poems about death um, and this this idea this romantic notion of dying is not met by the I guess the the true version the version which uh, Bering's character undergoes throughout the play. There's no real sort of connection between those, but yet there is a bit of a contrast between them, and it's one that is represented quite well. The flashbacks show Vivian as an academic, which also reflect her persona, that um, they reveal the irony of this researcher becoming a patient, and certainly we see that. We see someone who is so used to study, so used to picking fine details, that uh, driven across, I guess, change, changing the guard around, with her being the patient, we see that uh, represented in a far different sort of way. Okay, so let's look at the characters of the play and why the characters are important now. It is one that's character-driven to start with. Now, what that means is essentially that all the events of the, of the uh, play are driven by particularly the protagonist, but also by the other characters involved in it. And so, I really do see them, and we see them as a, as a, as a bunch of characters who are full of different contrasts. We get the cliched, aloof intellectual juxtaposed with the caring aspect of, of someone like Susie, for instance, who shows a sense of kindness rather than intellectual intellectualism and wit. Now, what this essentially uh, creates is we have this almost this competing um, philosophy that almost goes up against each other constantly. And indeed, this idea of the fact that you could almost call the intellectual uh, a bit cliched, is that um, the characters, uh, even though they're sort of stereotypical on the surface and that they follow fairly um, familiar patterns, they are quite um, deep as well and that they have their own sort of way of looking at things. And certainly uh, in terms of a play which is about cancer, which we normally look at with a human aspect, the fact that we've got these doctors, these medical researchers, looking at patience is almost as an amusement as a as a fascination so it shows this um this intellectual um almost disconnection between them and the real world and and the connection of the real world i guess of susie even though she doesn't really see it in a fine art sort of way that um, the intellectuals i guess of the group of the room sort of see it um the theme of the play also highlights the value of intellect, especially as, as Vivian's character uses it as a coping 
mechanism. So certainly we see the value of it as well. So it's not just a flaw or a weakness, it's something which is, is also quite a driving force and certainly this discussion of language and, and the play is almost at times a love letter to language and the way of studying language, to the beauty of it and to the, the many things it can do. And so this sort of idea is, is represented in the play as well. And hence, this is why the title is quite meaningful. So it, does, it is a love letter to language in that sense. And that it's not only a story about life and death, it's one about uh, the beauty of the world and certainly the beauty of the way we express the world through language and through, through prose and through, through literary styles and structures. And certainly we see that through the play's um, dissection of, of done at times. And we see it quite a bit through the language of the play and the styles of play itself. Certainly through the, the variety of techniques that it uses is one that really does enable these themes to come across. And certainly these, these films, uh, sorry, these themes, should I say, of, of, um, of death, of the intellect, of loneliness are certainly brought to life a lot by these, um, these ideas and certainly through the characters as well. Anyway, that's about it for the um, critical analysis of wit. I wish you the best with your responses. Remember to uh, continue to build on um, not only the, the, the work that we've covered here and the, and the ideas that we've covered here, but also to look at them in terms of what suits your, I, I guess, reading of the, of the play and, and certainly what is, um, what, how it influences the way that you um, see it, the way that you uh, believe it to, um, to be, and certainly the way that you can uh, express it. There are a number of different ways. And so each one of them, depending on which one you choose, needs to be justified. And these are certainly a lot of the ways that you can justify the ideas of the play. But otherwise, until next time, I'll see you later. Thank you.